Spoiler alert, Arrow Lake is an absolute mess. From the naming scheme to the performance, it's all pretty disappointing. I had high hopes for this to be a great return for Intel, but it's not. Despite Intel claiming a massive IPC uplift gen on gen, it's simply not true. This is not biased, these are facts. Prepare yourself for disappointment. Let's start off by getting the biggest thing out of the way with the Intel Core Ultra 9 285K, the price. The Intel Core Ultra 9 285K is going to be going for around 589 US dollars when it launches. As for its specs, the 285K is a 24 core, 24 threaded CPU with 8 P cores and 16 E cores with a base clock of around about 3.7 gigahertz and it should boost to around 5.7 gigahertz. I ran a one hour Cinebench stress test to see what the deal with power consumption was. And over that hour, I saw the 285K pulling 238 watts in default mode. And then in the MSI BIOS, when I switched it to extreme mode, it was pulling around 293 watts. The 285K can be completely unlocked and it can pull as much as, wait for this, 4,096 watts. I'm not even joking. If you had enough power and cooling, you could attempt to burn down your own house. Which leads us into Cinebench 2024 testing. In Cinebench 2024 multi-core, we see the 285K scoring 2,411 points. This puts it beyond the 14900KS and the Ryzen 9 9950X. In multi-core performance, that makes the 285K just over 7% faster than the 14900K and the 9950X. I guess we're off to a good start so far, right? In single core performance, it's slower than the 14900KS and within a margin of error faster than the last generation 14900K. What I thought was interesting was a CPU based benchmark that I've used many times, the Linux kernel compile test. In this test, we compile the Linux 6.8 kernel from source using the Pharonix test suite. In source code compile using defconfig, we see the 285K compile the Linux 6.8 kernel from source in around about 48 seconds. That's not a bad result, but it's only about 8% faster than the 14900K. So not a huge uplift here. The next thing was knowing what 3D performance was like without any restrictions using a GeForce RTX 4090 Founders Edition. And before you ask, I'm aware that Windows 11 23H2 is marginally fast with Arrow Lake, but that does not accurately represent the use case. 24H2 is recommended and it was used to test all of the CPUs. Running older operating system builds is not a solution, it's simply a band-aid fix. As usual with CPU testing, we ran all of these tests at their lowest settings at 1080p and 1440p. Here's why. With GPUs like 4090, we are quite CPU bound and both at 1080p and 1440p, that's the case these days, yeah. And also I was curious to know what that was gonna be like. Let's start off with Counter-Strike 2. This is a really good repeatable benchmark in the Steam Workshop that we use for all of our CPU testing. At 1080p, the 9950X is the fastest. For average frame rate, the 9950X is about five to 6% faster on average. And in 1% lows, the 9950X is 25% faster. And the 14900K is about 6% faster. At 1440p, the gap was closed a little with the 14900K being the fastest overall. It was about 2% faster than the 285K on average. And in 1% lows, the 9950X is the fastest being around about 23% faster. Moving on to Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p, this benchmark is quite old now, but the great thing about this one is that for CPU based benchmarks, it does a great job of exposing weaknesses. Again, the 9950X is the fastest CPU of the bunch, being around 9% faster than the 285K on average. For 1% lows, the 285K and the 9950X are about on par. Jumping over to 1440p, we're seeing the 9950X be around 9% faster than the 285K, and the 285K being around 8% faster than the 14900K on average. As for 1% lows, the 9950X is about 5% faster than the 285K, the 285K is better than the 14900K for 1% lows being around about 15% faster. Moving on to Cyberpunk 2077, again, the 9950X is the fastest out of the bunch again. 
being only slightly faster than the 285K, the 285K is about 4% faster than the 14900K here. At 1440p, we're seeing all three CPUs being about on par with each other, with the 14900K being the outlier here, being about 4% slower on average, but being around 6% faster than the 9950X and for the 285K for the 1% lows. On to Horizon Zero Dawn at 1080p, the 9950X, no surprises here, it's the fastest of the lot, but the difference is only about 5% faster. On the flip side, the 285K is about 7% faster than the 14900K. The outlier here being the 1% lows. The 9950X is 34% faster than the 285K, and the 285K is about 23% faster than the 14900K. At 1440p, the 9950X again is around 6% faster on average as compared to the 285K, and the 285K is about 7% faster than the 14900K. As for 1% lows, the 9950X is about 40% faster than the 285K, and the 285K is about 16% faster than the 14900K. Finally, onto a game I've personally sunk hundreds of hours into, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. COD is quite sensitive to CPU clock speeds, so it's a great indication of performance. At 1080p, the 9950X is 20% faster than the 285K on average, but in 1% lows, we're seeing that difference be around about 8% in difference. What's more interesting is that the 14900K is 4% faster than the 285K on average. At 1440p, it's more of the same with the 285K being 4% slower than the 9950X and around about 2% slower than the 14900K on average. Now, if we calculate the average over all of these five games tested, the Ryzen 9 9950X is about 6% faster than the 285K, while the 285K is only about 1% faster on average over the 14900K. Yeah, a whole new platform and 1% faster in gaming performance gen on gen, and it's still slower than the 9950X. Here's the most interesting thing with the 285K though. Even after all this testing, I wasn't convinced that what I was seeing was right. I thought that I'd made some kind of mistake with the CPU. Everything was all over the place and the gaming results were just confusing. The power consumption while testing was just up and down. The stability of the platform itself was a nightmare. Although the Cinebench performance and the kernel compile performance was really good, I surely, surely wasn't the only one that was having these doubts about this platform. And it turns out I wasn't. I did what any sane person would do and I consulted the god of benchmarking himself, Steve from Hardware Unboxing. This is what Steve found. You ready for this? You better hold on to your hat. In a Plague Tale Requiem, Hardware Unbox found that in this sequence, when nothing is happening in the game, that while the power consumption on the 285K is low, the average frame rate is about the same as the 14900K. However, the 1% lows on average are about 30% lower than the 14900K, all while using more of the 285K's performance to do less. That's not all though. When stuff is actually happening in the game and the area is populated by NPCs and more geometry, while the power consumption is still low on the 285K, on average, it's about 25 to 26% slower than the 14900K, and in 1% low performance, the difference is about 17% worse than the 14900K. The 285K isn't doing anything, and the performance is worse because of it. The power consumption argument is null because the core usage on the 285K is higher, yet the performance is way worse. And it doesn't stop there. For a bit more comparison, we're seeing after a full benchmark run on the 285K, it's about 22% slower on average as compared to the 14900K. In fact, the 285K is slower than the i5-12600K. That's just embarrassing. And again, it doesn't stop there. We ran Cyberpunk 2077 in our tests using the built-in benchmark, but when Hardware and Box ran their tests in a densely populated area in Phantom Liberty, the 285K in best case scenario 
was 25% slower than the 14900K, and a whopping 53% slower than the Ryzen 7 7800X3D. Those numbers just do not lie. And if you thought it couldn't get any worse, wait for it. With a 14 game average as tested by Hardware Unbox, the Intel Core Ultra 9 285K is about 5% slower than the 14900K. Do I even need to mention the 1% low difference here? Again, shout out to Steve from Hardware Unbox for making sure that I wasn't going insane because Intel claimed that on average, the 285K was about 9% faster on average than the 14900K. Yeah. Well, the lie detector determined that was a lie. This just proves that Intel doesn't care about gaming anymore and that if this new Intel platform does anything really well, it's making AMD look better than it is, which is saying a lot because Ryzen 9000 was a whole lot of disappointment as well. The funniest thing is Intel is pushing this whole AI thing and they're pushing it down our throats without considering that we don't care. The reality is uh, what I'm saying now probably won't age well, but right now we don't care. And that's not to say that we won't ever care about AI, but right now, if you wanna do anything AI related, use your graphics card. It's just going to be faster. Even the low end cards are faster than any CPUs at the moment. And before you say something like, oh, you're an AMD shill or something crazy like that, let's start off with some facts. 12th gen Intel was great. We saw awesome uplifts in performance from 11th gen. 13th gen Intel was marginally better and I gamed on a 13th gen system for two years because I found it to be really good. 14th gen was pretty underwhelming and it seems as though Intel Core Ultra Series 2 processors are following the same trend. Intel is going backwards with their CPUs and the problem is at a foundational level. Intel PI in Australia changed to a different agency and we were not notified of a change which is highly unusual. We then had to pull a rabbit out of a hat to try and get these new CPUs. We ended up getting what we needed. We, we got two CPUs with no help from Intel or their PR company. Mind you, this is with days to spare. This is easily the most annoying, the most unprofessional and basically just the worst experience that I've ever had with Intel and a PR company. And from what I can tell, my jokes about being in Intel jail at our own expense, they just weren't jokes. To catch you up on this situation, if you don't know, it seems as though Intel got a bit upset at us at Computex because we showed the inside of this new socket. Well, it was on a gigabyte board. And from what I can gather, because we made a joke about it on Twitter, and this is purely speculation because the timing just correlates way too well with Computex and then a new Intel launch and then we're not hearing from them. But let me lay out some facts about this whole situation. We didn't sign an NDA. No one told us that we couldn't do it. And when we were asked to take it down, we cut that section of the video out with no hesitation and everything seemed hunky-dory. We didn't make a song and dance about it because we always play fair. And then I decided to make a joke at our own expense, laughing at how silly we were in the classic Aussie way. And Intel being Intel, Decides, you know what, you're not worthy anymore. The funniest part of this whole situation is we didn't say anything about the RMA 13th and 14th gen chips. We didn't mention their microcode issues. We didn't mention them laying off a massive chunk of their workforce. We didn't mention that they bully motherboard vendors into doing whatever they want. In fact, we never mentioned that stuff because it's just not our style. We didn't even talk about any leaks or any speculation because we like the facts. And the fact is, Intel Core Ultra Series 2 is an absolute mess. Intel thinks it's okay to bully reviewers by ghosting them and not supplying them with CPU samples. If this was any other channel or any other outlet for that fact, Intel wouldn't have batted an eyelid, but because we're smaller, they think they can bully us. Now, I'm not saying that we're entitled to review samples at all. We've always been really thankful for what we get because it's not a lot, but it's enough to run this channel. And I'm very grateful for the position that we're in. What I'm saying is Intel wants to play games. The only problem is no one is going to be playing games with this new Intel generation. Now, all this drama aside, Intel Core Ultra Series 2 is a mess. They know it. Now you know it, and it doesn't matter if Intel doesn't want to work with reviewers like us anymore because we're not going to be bullied into doing anything.